Hi, I'm Karen Brown of Just Get It Done Quilts, and welcome to Karen's Quilt Circle. In 2017, at QuiltCon in Savannah, Georgia, I was so excited to be signing up for a Mary Fawn's workshop called Giants. But after a 48-hour ordeal of planes, trains, and automobiles, I showed up not just late, but very late and very bedraggled without any luggage, which meant I had no quilting supplies. And as I was telling Mary about the broken plane and the fog and being stranded in Washington, D.C., I suddenly felt it was just all too much. And I was seconds from collapse when Mary just gathered me up into this big hug. She took me aside, showed me what I needed to do, and she shared her fabrics to get me back on track. My fellow classmates also stepped up for me, giving me tools and supplies to help me get through the day. Truly, it was one of those miraculous moments when through kindness of strangers, my day, my trip, and my life turned around. I had found my tribe, and I knew that I wanted to be part of the quilting community. So you can imagine how thrilled I was when Mary said yes to being on the show. It's like I've come full circle. And there was no one I wanted to talk to more about the legacy of quilting than her. Despite her being in London, England, and myself in Toronto, Canada, it was like talking to an old friend about our favorite subject. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea and here is my interview with Mary Fonz. Hello, Mary. Thank you for coming and being on the show. I am so excited to have you here. It is a pleasure to be here, Karen. Big time. Now, I understand you are in London. I never, I thought you were never leaving Chicago again. You know, it's funny, the, the, the spell that London casts, apparently, because I really love it here. And I, I never wanted to leave Chicago, and I don't think I ever really will. But I, I don't know. London is, it's a special place. I, I don't have like a, a strong desire to travel the whole world because I get very, I get very weird if I can't speak the language of a place. I don't find it exciting. I don't find it like, oh, it's so great to get lost and like communicate, you know, through your eyes. I mean, I love all, all the cultures, right? But if I, if I can't speak the language, I feel shut out of it, you know? So in London, you have, you know, all of this wonderful foreign stuff. It's very different, but I know how to talk to the people and that, and that's really nice. So it feels different, but also um, explorable in a way that that I feel like I'm getting something out of. So how much of a quilting kit have you been able to bring with you? It's funny you ask that. I have something right here because I thought, what am I going to do to tell Karen? I mean, I would love to have some lovely background, you know, with quilts and everything. And I do have some quilts with me, but I brought my stash in case you wanted to know. This is it. <laughs> I brought, look at these little bits. I'm doing some, some handwork, which sounds really good for what it is. I'm, I'm learning needle turned applique, like on my own, you know, but I brought the things and I've got my project that I'm working on, but I brought, you know, just enough to do the leaves that I need to do, you know, and, and it's just, it's just very little. I brought really, my really good scissors though. You know, you have to have the really good scissors, but yeah, I mean, I just, I couldn't pack too much. And what's been funny is I've had a few uh, Zoom lectures, you know, for guilds that I set up before I came here, before I knew I was coming here. I did, <laughs> so I have some quilts because I had to do those those gigs, but for the um, LA Modern Quilt Guild, I did a gig at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> That was, it was tougher than I thought it was going to be. There have been okay. nights in my life, in my misspent youth, when I was up easily till 3.30 in the morning. But these days, you know, at 41, it's a little, it's a little different. Speaking of your younger years, you've got a wonderful YouTube video out there of you doing a poetry slam. I'm yeah. so young. The I am so young poem. I mean, the, the refrain and the point of it is that, you know, people would tell me in my twenties, you know, oh, you're young, you know, you're, you'll be fine. You're young. You can do, you can do whatever you want. You know, you're young, your heart's broken, but you'll get over it. You're young. And I was so tired of hearing it because I was so scared and I didn't know what to do with my life. And I was hurting or all these things. And, and the, the poem is like a referendum on all those people who say you're so young. And it's like, well, it's hard to be young. So, so stop telling me that because, you know, you're glad you're not this young. You're, you're, you're lucky that you're not, you know, 
I haven't written a poem in a while. I haven't finished a quilt in a while. I don't know what, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing with my life? I've been reading your uh, Paper Girl blog since Savannah, Georgia. So you've had a lot of turmoil in your life in the last number of years. So I think you can give yourself a break. Thank you. I mean, I, I'm serious. Like, thank you. Sometimes you need someone to tell you like, you know, yeah, <laughs> like it's okay. It's nice to hear that. There is, you know, objectively, I, there is lots of, you know, upheaval and things like that. So yeah. Why not? Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, I remember the first time hearing the, the name Mariana Fons, and I went, gee, I wonder if she's related to Mary. Do you find <laughs> that more and more people know you before your mother now? Wow. I don't get that a lot. That is, that's pretty awesome. I mean, some people call me Marianne. They're like, oh, Marianne. And I'm like, oh, no, no. If I was my mom, I mean, she had some, she had some good face cream, you know, cause she's, we always know what ages we are. Cause we're 30 years apart. So she's 71, I'm 41, but, um, wow, you know, that's exciting. It's like, is Marianne Fonz related to Mary Fonz? It's usually the other way. It is usually <laughs> the other way. Well, I didn't come up through the magazines and the teaching that way. I came, I was probably in that cohort that first started learning off of YouTube. And right. so that, so Quilty was the first go-to. Um, yeah. For a long time, it was just you and Missouri Star, yeah, and you know you'd have odd ones here and there, but you were yeah. those were the two big channels, yeah. or at least the ones that kept pop popping up on my feed. That's good, and the ones that that you liked, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's yeah, yeah, that's that awesome. used the colors and the fabrics and everything yeah. that I wanted to do. And yeah. look at you now, like I I need to say you're amazing. I mean, you told me that story about how you came into the class at QuiltCon. I mean, I don't know. I think your story and your trajectory just, it proves that this world of quilt making in America and beyond, but, you know, we know this country best. I mean, this is a, it's an open field. People want to connect. They, I mean, I don't need to tell you this, but I mean, you know, in a few short years, very few short years, you have found a community. People have found you. And quilt making in America, it's just, it never gets old. It never gets um, finished. And the way it keeps evolving, the people who rise as teachers, the people who rise as designers, I mean, it's so great. It's so great. I'm so glad you're here. And thank you for asking <laughs> on your show. Because I just started a YouTube channel. And let me tell you, I have like 87 subscribers because I'd never done it before. <laughs> I was like, well, you know, maybe Karen will give me some tips. The first one is YouTube is a long game. Yeah. You, yeah. And yeah. you start off in your crap, but yeah, right. you, you want to be crap. You want to have no subscribers at the beginning while you're crappy. <laughs> you know, you want to learn right, exactly. mistakes. Don't and then it. when the subscribers finally arrive, you know yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, that's good. But what I really wanted to talk to you today, because I think this is a big area of common interest between us is mm -hmm. legacy. You're involved with Quilt Folk magazine now and but but before Quilt Folk you were still very very interested in the history. I remember yes. you curating a line of fabric that were based mm -hmm. on old patterns. Mm -hmm. When did you get interested in the history of quilts? So when I first started in the quilt thing um, and let me tell you that I grew up you know with Marianne Fawns, you know, this, this, you know, person who is kind of a Betty Crocker name, you know, in the mm -hmm. quilt world, like it's, you know, it's her and Liz, you know, she and Liz, they, they made, um, you know, they made the way for a lot of like traditional quilters. And because of what they did, I, I mean, it was my mom's work. I didn't, I didn't sew at her knee, you know, I wasn't like, oh, mom's sewing, this is our time together, you know, it was work for her. So I, I didn't make any quilts until I was like 28. And I call it my quilt epiphany. Um, I was 28, I had major health problems, I had ulcerative colitis and had many surgeries, all of which went poorly. Like I just had really bad luck with all my abdominal surgeries, you can imagine, not great, you know, it's really hard. And I was married very briefly, got divorced. It was a hard time. And so at some point in my very late twenties, I, I sort of woke up <laughs> in the middle of the night, basically. And the way I tell it is that I understood that when your life is torn into a million pieces, it makes perfectly good sense to tear up perfectly good fabric into a million pieces and sew it back together again. Like, Oh my God. And so I kind of was like, Oh, I want to make a quilt. And I also think kind of talking about the, I am so young thing too. And I am 
answering your question slowly, but um, but determinedly. Um, you know, when you're young, I, when I was young, I didn't want to do what my mom did. I, you know, I didn't. Uh, but as I got older, and certainly as I as my life, you know, was at one point sort of, you know, sort of unclear if I was going to pull through this particular problem. Um, family became more important. Legacy became more important. And I was like, oh, the Fonz family is like a quilting family. Like this is a thing that my mother does. And this is a thing that we know and like publishing too. My grandma started the first town paper in her little town of Norwalk, Iowa, you know? So it's like hmm, ink and fabric, you know? Like this is something we do and it's okay for me to do it. So I started making quilts, but I didn't know how. I had never really done it with my mom. So I just jumped in and at the beginning, I wanted to make all the quilts. I just want, you know, you know what it's like. You're just like, ah, I want to do this. And that's how we get the UFOs. You had a great video, you know, what do you do with these? Or just, you know, finish them. And, and, and so I, that's the, that was my time when I made a lot of UFOs and a lot of quilts too. But at some point, what was it? I mean, I think, I think I just, I always, I'm a curious person in all kinds of ways, but I want to know I want to know stuff. And I was just reading something about um, World War I Red Cross quilts. It was just like dipping into this book. And it was this, it was this article about quilts in World War I. And I was like, this is why I like quilt history because I'm curious about everything. I don't know anything about World War I. I, I know like two things. Like there was the guy who was shot, you know, in the Balkans, Franz Ferdinand, and there was trench warfare. And that's all I know. But if I read that article about quilts, Red, Red Cross quilts in World War I from AQSG's Uncovering this Journal, I will know so much about World War I through quilts. And so as I kind of like poked around and I was looking primarily at the Whitney Museum of Art, they had an exhibit in 1971 that changed everything. They, they had an exhibit of quilts in this major museum in New York City. And it was the first time that a major museum had put quilts on the wall as art, like as art objects. It was called abstract design and American quilt. And it like, it changed the course of history because whenever somebody asks about whether quilts are art or not, it kind of goes back to that moment. So I was like, wow, what was that about? That's very interesting. And the more I looked at that, the more I wanted to look at the other, the other eras of quilt making, the other times, you know? And as I looked, I got more interested and I realized all the things I want to learn. The quilts, if you follow the story of quilts, you get the story of America fully. I mean, fully all of the beauty and the pain and the, the racial problems, the economics. I mean, the depression era, the quilts of the depression era show you that time period. I mean, they show you poverty. They show you hope. They show you all the dye technologies that were happening at that time in America show up in the quilts, that green color in a, you know, that mint green color that shows up in those depression era quilts. We could, it was everywhere. And I don't even like that color. Like, I don't even like depression era quilts that much, but that dye wasn't invented until that time. So they had this cool, like new green color. And so it, it showed up a lot. So it's just like, oh my God, all this stuff I'm curious about. I just follow the trail of quilts and it teaches me everything. I love that. So your mother, did she just start quilting? Was it something that she liked or was there a legacy behind her? Like, did she have aunts or her mother or grandmother? And no, mom, she, it was the bicentennial era. You know, people wanted to celebrate the, the 200th anniversary of America. And it was a thing. It was a thing that people were interested in doing. They wanted to get back to their roots. It was like after the Vietnam War and people were searching for authenticity, you know, and like it was, you know, people were making quilts in Central Park. It was like a thing. And she wanted to as well. And she went into the extension office in Winterset, Iowa and signed up for a class. And she met Liz Porter there. And they, they made a quilt and then they made more and people were like, there's no books on quilting. And they thought, well, we could probably write one. They both had English degrees or something. And they're like, maybe we could write one. Yeah, she just did it. It was kind of a trend. And I'm really hoping that happens again, like for the general public, like for the masses, you know, I hope that quilts, you know, there's lots of millions of quilters in America, but in the 19, in 1976, there weren't that many. The bicentennial blew up 
quilts in America. It was the revival, right? I think COVID is doing that. I think uh, the thousands of people that are coming to quilting and not even directly that they've come to it to do masks, making face masks, yeah. and then they've got all these scraps left over. Well, yes. what do you do? You make a quilt. That so, is so fascinating. So Karen, many beginners right. are um, coming in or they've just got wow. time on their hands. So they're digging out the sewing machines and figuring mm. out what to do. And I, you've talked about this before in your lectures about how we have dismissed these handcrafts as not feminist. Like this is a, this is a struggle that a lot of women have had um, because that's what, that's what a woman who doesn't value herself does as opposed to a woman that appreciates the, her strengths and her and everything so she doesn't do knitting she doesn't do that but realizing you know what that's not true they can both coexist yeah I'm so glad you mentioned that I mean it's one of those sort of a passion it's a passion of mine to sort of release people from having to decide or having to have an opinion on whether quilting is inherently feminist or not I mean it's just, it, it was interesting. I dove into that subject for a paper in grad school, you know, kind of going in with this idea that quilting, making quilts is like an inherently feminist act today because you're like embracing like the, the woman's work of the past that was never celebrated. But, you know, it's, it's really, it's not true that it wasn't celebrated. I mean, if you see a beautiful quilt that was made in 1875, it is true that you know women did not have the choices that we have today it is true that you know they did not have the vote till 1920 it is true but to say that their family did not value their work to say that their community didn't value how good they were at quilt making it's 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 not true and what it does is it's like this false value system like oh because they didn't sell their quilts and get rich it wasn't valued this is a problem, you know, this is like, mm, there's a lot of kinds of ways to value things. And I'm not like an apologist for, you know, the problems of, you know, women's oppression and all that stuff. But I just, I was really excited to, to dig into that, Karen, because it was a surprise to me how I felt about it. I was like, you know, you don't have to say you're a feminist to make quilts. And maybe some people are like, well, yeah, I don't say that. But, but it was interesting, especially with the modern quilters, you had a lot of like political quilts that were very clear because they had text on them, you know, with political ideology. And some people really, really felt left out of that. And just like, you know, I don't want to be political in my quilts. Get your politics out of my quilting. And, you know, they have a point, <laughs> frankly. And I didn't know that I would feel that way, but I really do. I really do. What I like about quilting is that there's so many ways you can come to it. Like, hmm. I personally love color. I love the math. And I often, as I'm working with something and enjoying it, thinking back to my grandmother and her mother who would have done handicrafts and thinking, well, if you liked math and you were stuck on a farm in the prairies, what would you do? Yeah. What would you do? And quilting would fill that mm -hmm. part of your yeah. life. And, yes. you know, there's the other people that are just there to, because they love to do meticulous work and yeah. it can fill that and some people just yeah. want to be part of a community and you think of all the wonderful things that used to happen around a sewing circle the yeah. more i get involved in quilting the more passionate i have actually become because i just think there's a spot in it for everyone exactly yeah i i couldn't agree more i think some of the women who and speaking about, you know, women's oppression and all that stuff. I mean, it, it cannot be denied. What you're saying is absolutely true. I mean, there are women who, if it was a different time, would be astronauts. I mean, but they couldn't be. So they made, they made quilts that just defy, like, reason. They're so beautiful. They just don't, they're impossibly beautiful. And you think, well, she was an engineer. <laughs> Obviously, she was an extremely good engineer. She just didn't have the chance, you know, and it is, yeah, it's complicated, you know, but, but you're absolutely right. I mean, someone, some brilliant woman who was just biting her, you know, fingernails off, trying to think of something to do to fill the, the time when she wasn't taking care of the family. Yeah. Like engineering, drafting a beautiful quilt block, like totally, you know, yeah. Has your style of quilting changed since you've um, discovered all these wonderful quilts. You've been exposed to so many now. 
yes, my style of quilt making has changed. And I feel like a fraud. Um, I have imposter syndrome anyway, but lately, I mean, I haven't made a quilt. I haven't finished a quilt, Karen, in like, I mean, come on, like three years. I went to graduate school. I fell in love and got married with the person that I met, you know, in a bar. And four months later, we got married at City Hall. It's true. I love him more every day. Love my life. But anyway, so life has been a little nuts. But, but that aside, yes, I am working on on a pictorial applique quilt. There's no pattern. You couldn't write a pattern for this if you wanted to, and no one would want to make it. It's really, it's really weird. And so the more I learn about quilts and, and these older quilts at the Shelburne Museum in Vermont, they have really wonderful pictorial quilts. And you look at these things and they're huge. And there are birds and animals and soldiers and flowers and they're not uniform. These figures that they look, think about Harriet Powers Bible quilt. A lot of people know what that one looks like if they don't know other pictorial quilts. I mean, it's a really famous quilt, maybe the most famous period in America, in American history. It's at the Smithsonian. And I mean, the figures that she has in her quilt are very, they're rudimentary. They clearly show like the person who made it had an artistic sense. I mean, they're awesome, but they're, they're simple. Um, they're not like finely wrought, you know, figures. And I think there's an idea when people think about the quilts of old, that they were all amazing. You know, that they, that all of the people who made these quilts were very good at sewing and they were very good at making quilts and they loved it. Like you read some of the diaries from, you know, early, you know, well, a couple like from like, um, you know, around the turn of the 19th century. I mean, the girls, some of these women hated sewing. They were like, mother made me sew again. You know, I feel like I'm gonna, you know, scream or something like that. They didn't like it. So the more I see these older quilts and know more about quilt history, the weirder my quilts get because it's okay. And I made quilts by the book and loved it. Most of the quilts I made in the beginning were for TV or because we were going to teach something from that quilt. You know what it's like. You make a sample quilt, you're going to do a step out or talk about it. So you make quilts for a thing. And because I haven't done any of that for a long time, I make quilts for me and they're weird and they're not that good, but it's totally okay. And I've, and I've, I've never been happier. I mean, I really, I, I like to make quilts that are pictorial and just really unique. When did you join Quilt Folk? I joined Quilt Folk as a writer on issue four. So it was the first year of the Quilt Folk's life. It was in 2016. And I went to Tennessee and was a writer. And then I like to say I clawed my way up the corporate ladder. There's like four people who work there. So, um, but I, I, you know, went to school for writing. I've been an editor before and, you know, I was like, on the path to be the editor of Cool Folk in pretty short amount of time, I think 2017. I can remember hearing that you were, and I'm going, of course, of course she would be. <laughs> She's a writer about quilts. She loves the history. I, I couldn't think of a better marriage. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I agree. I agree. It's, it's a very special project and I really, I'm really lucky. So how yeah. do you prepare to go into the field? Have you pre-selected these people? How do you decide on the state? <laughs> so I have a map. I know it's hard. There's 50 of them. You know, it's true. It's like, oh, where do you go? So my approach is, well, it's to avoid a problem because there's a problem. If you are not careful, you know, this is a, the long game, right? Like you said, like YouTube, I mean, making this sort of encyclopedic, sort of encyclopedia because people keep quilt folk, you know, it's ad free, you have it on your sh shelf and you collect them all, you know? So you, I want to avoid getting to a point where we're like, oh crap, South Dakota, North Dakota and Rhode Island, New Jersey, you know, you don't want to get stuck doing a few um, issues on New England states at once, you know, so so I want to make sure we're bouncing around like a ping pong, really going to different places so that you get um, Southern California was issue 11. Uh, sorry, issue 10 was Vermont. Then we went to Southern California for issue 11. Then we went to Kentucky. So you get visually because it's such a visual publication, you get mm -hmm. visually just this huge difference. So every issue, though you know it's going to be a state, it's very different and it feels different. So so that's how I pick the states. I find that like they all have a very, very different feel to them. Part of it is you're taking pictures in the wild. So the geography is so very different in exactly. the background of all of them. You really feel 
it's a, and it's so interesting that quilting has grown up differently in different states yes. based on I guess the people that move there and yeah the, the the regional difference this is very interesting like like people ask me a lot like are there differences between region you know region to region are, are quilts different do they look different what do people do and I for the most part there's not that much because when people started making quilts like in big numbers like in the you know 19th century newspapers and magazines were flourishing. I mean, print media was going nuts. And so there were quilt columns in newspapers. The Chicago Tribune read, uh, ran a, a quilt like pattern for years. Nancy Cabot was like this quilt column in the, in the Chicago Tribune. So people shared quilts and patterns all across the United States. So there wasn't like a bubble of like, you know, Kentucky quilts and, and you know, then a bubble of like Oregonian quilts. People were all making like flying geese everywhere. But in New England, like there's so many art quilters, so many. I mean, Vermont, and we're doing Connecticut now, right now, while we're having this interview, there, it's like an artisan kind of vibe out there, and there's a lot of art quilters, and and down south, um, kind of, kind of depends. I mean, a lot of, a lot of times, it's it, the people and their background is different, but the quilts are kind of the unifying factor, and the fact that they're quilt makers. I mean, we're the best people, you know. <laughs> We're just, I mean, we're the best, we're the best. I'm sure the stamp collectors think they're the best, but, but we're the best. <laughs> but yeah, and, and, and to answer your question about how we figure out who we're gonna have, um, we do a lot of research. Sometimes we do a pitch meeting and people will pitch ideas, which is great. But I'm really good at Google. And I do know, I know people like when we went to Kentucky, Shelly Ziegert, really famous lady. She's got a big collection, has done a lot of scholarship and stuff. So it was like, okay, let's talk to Shelly. But Mike, the publisher, and me too, we don't want to just do superstars, you know, quilt folk, you know, folk. Who are the people? Who are the people making quilts and 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 what's the culture there um, of quilt making? So we dig deep. We dig really deep. Um, and um, I, inclusivity is so important, you know, to reflect, you know, it's so interesting to reflect the real America in terms of quilt making. I mean, this is a very diverse population. I mean, it's, and I don't think not to like say that we've got it in the bag or, you know, say that Quilt Folk's the first publication to really focus on that. But I mean, it's really, it's really wonderful to see like all the different communities and all the different socioeconomic backgrounds. Quilting is truly democratic. And we had a, our first ever themed issue because the coronavirus, the pandemic kept us from the road, Karen. We could not travel in May, which is when we would usually have traveled for issue 16. So instead of a state, we focused on a theme and had people send in their stories, the theme of family. And we got stories from all all corners of the nation and we we got to see who our audience was and our audience is diverse and it is fascinating and the people who sent us stories you know 250 different people submitted stories it was a, a rainbow a pageant of different kinds of people and i was so heartened by that because you know that's cool that means that people can find themselves in quilt folk you know i also like the the way that you just dealt with covid that was a, a brilliant move on your behalf. I just thought that was, you know, talking about what pulls us together. It's family and quilts and beautiful issue to do. Thanks. It was really, oh, it, was, it was tough. It was, it was hard. I mean, yeah, we have this luxury of having all that beautiful photography wherever we go. And I mean, mm, 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 it was tough. It was, I mean, people have wonderful photographs, but here's the problem high resolution to have it yes. printable, to have it really good. It has to be very high resolution. And I mean, this is like boring stuff, but I mean, if you don't have it, you can't print it. And so these wonderful pictures people were sending of their grandma and them sewing, you know, 50 years ago, it was like, that's so good. Can you get it to us in high res? And they were like, what? <laughs> I mean, why yeah, should they what? know that? But <laughs> oh, so, hard. so we were just like, oh, it was a lot of tech help, you know? But it yeah. worked out. Before COVID, did you get out to the museum in Nebraska very often? Yes. In fact, um, the International Quilt Museum is such a special place, as you know. Have you been there? No, but I retired at the beginning of the year. My, my husband and I had a business and we decided we would close it and be semi-retired. And we would travel 
you know, I had plans to do all these trips. My husband and I both have a motorcycle and thought, oh, we'll just go out to Nebraska and see that place. Well, I've had other plans. <laughs> yes, you've been, a, you've been a bit busy. Um, when, when you do, when you do eventually, you will love it. It's like church for quilts, you know? And um, I love the International Quilt Museum. I'm on the board. I've been on the board for three years and I keep thinking, you know, I hope they let me be there, you know, and I, because I love it so much. And, and I think its profile will keep growing. I mean, it's International Quilt Museum. They have quilts from all over the world. I mean, their collection is really incredible. And it's in Lincoln, Nebraska, as you know. So it's kind of, you know, it's in the middle of the country. It's not like it's in Chicago or it's in New York. You know, you have to really make a trip out. But I think that's part of the magic of the place. Because, and also, you know, women making quilts in the United States, I mean, the Plains, you know, what a perfect place for a quilt museum, Nebraska, Kansas, you know, Iowa, this is, this is really a huge part of the history of it. So yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I've seen quilts there that made me cry, you know, like, often, most, most, of, most of the time I'm there, and I'm going to cry when I see a quilt, because they care about them. You know, I, it's probably true for you. But sometimes you tell people you make quilts and you're into quilts and they're like, oh, that's nice. Like, mm, like my, you know, my grandma's quilts. And for one thing, like, do not cast shade on grandma. Like we are, you would, you should be so lucky that you have a grandmother that makes quilts or taught you how to quilt. You know, I get, I don't use too many of the ists or the isms, but like ageism is real with quilts. People will say, oh, it's something my grandma did. Like, yeah, she did. And she was the backbone of your community. So why don't you just, anyway. Um, but you may get this, that people kind of, you know, don't really get your quilt thing or they just don't quite understand why, you know, you spend all your time doing it or something. But, but the quilt museum, they know and they see the beauty in this and they know how important the people are who make this world and it's nice to be there because they're like yeah what you're doing is really special and you're part of this legacy of quilt making in america everybody who makes quilts is part of it everybody even if they make one you're part of it did you get to see the ken burns exhibit i did I did. I we saw the interview that, that you had with him i got to see it and i okay let me tell you let me tell you about talking to ken so, I mean, we got 10 minutes with him because Quilt Folk wanted to cover it. And, you know, so we got to go and we took pictures there and, and there's, a, there's a PDF you can get if you go on Quilt Folk uh, website, you can, I don't think you can still get it. Oh God. We did a, a PDF, a digital PDF about the show. And it was just this moonshot that we could maybe talk to him and Leslie Levy, who is the executive director of the Quilt Museum in Nebraska, she knows Ken because, you know, she knows Ken because they served on the board of the Willa Cather like foundation or something, the okay. writer Willa Cather. Anyway, so she knows, she knows Ken, Kenny, and she helped us get 10 minutes, Karen, 10 minutes. And his publicist was like, you have 10 minutes with him, you know, and I was so ready. And I recorded the, he gave me like 12 or 13, but that was all. I mean, it was not like, oh, I like you. Let's talk for a while. He's Ken Burns. So I was like, okay. But I have a recording, of course, of the conversation because I had like three different ways to record it in case I would screw it up and lose it all. <laughs> and before, so dumb, but it's great. Before the conversation, you can hear me on the recordings going, okay. Don't screw this up. Just be cool. Be cool. Be cool. <laughs> like that's how it like recording leads up. And then, and he was super nice and he was very, um, very interesting. It was very interesting to talk to him. Um, and he said something really interesting about quilts because one of the things I asked him was, you know, don't you think quilts are a little complicated? It's not something people want to talk about. A lot of people don't even think about it because it doesn't come up and, you know, why would you go there? But Quilts are complicated in American history because the reason that we have so many and the reason quilt making became such a thing in like starting in like 18, you know, 1850 and, you know, it wasn't because there wasn't any fabric. It was because there was so much fabric around that people could play with it. You had fabric everywhere so you could play with it. And the reason that you had fabric, so much of it, cheap, abundant fabric, 
is because slaves were picking cotton in the South and they weren't getting paid. And then they shipped the cotton that the slaves picked up to the New England mills where children were making that into fabric. And I mean, it's true. It's not like an opinion I have, you know, the reason we had cheap, cheap cotton calico that we could buy and make quilts out of is because people were oppressed and that's why cotton fabric got so cheap. We had to import it from England before that, before the industrial revolution, no one could afford any of it. Only the richest ladies made quilts, but then because of that, it changed. And so, you know, it's like, uh, but shying away from that, it's a bad, it's a bad move. Not because you're not politically correct, but because the story is so much deeper and interesting about quilts. So I asked Ken Burns, I was like, aren't quilts kind of complicated? Like, like, do you, do we have to look at quilts differently? Cause he collects all these older quilts, you know, 18, late 1800s and, and on up a little bit. And I was like, you know, are they problematic? You know, that term is like overused and weird, but I was like, what's the deal with, you know, slavery and child labor in, in relation to quilts. And he said something very interesting. He was like, history is complicated. Um, America is complicated, but the quilts that we have made and everyone has made them, rich, poor, black, white, all this sort of represent the best of us in terms of design and beauty. And it is complicated how we get to pretty much anything, you know, but, but the quilts remain as these, you know, artifacts and these sort of markers and, and memories of, of who we are. And I'm paraphrasing, he was much more you know, articulate than that. But I mean, it was, he was like, it's okay. It's okay to know that and still love these quilts because they're lovable and they mean a lot in many different ways. I like that, the best of the best. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The last thing I wanna talk to you about is labels. I have not labeled any of my quilts so far. I think I've maybe labeled two and they had to go in exhibits and that's why I had to put a label on them. Are labels common? Is that just a new thing with quilts or do you find that right back to the beginning that people labeled their quilts? Great question. No, people did not always label their quilts. And I think the reason you hear that all the time, you gotta label your quilts. And by the way, I never do it. I'm like, you have to label your quilts. Most of my quilts, unless my mom put them on, like I have to do it. <laughs> it's, it's shameful. And I just admitted it. Um, labels are, are really desired and people can be sort of, you know, I don't know, they really get after you about putting on labels because people didn't put them on before. Rarely did they sign them or yeah, put a label on them or quilt their name into them or make patchwork that said, you know, made by Ida B. Smith, 1895. You know, there's definitely a lot of those. It's like, you will remember who made this quilt. There's 900 pieces in it. I love that, love Ida. But the, we wish more had those labels because even though it seems weird, you know, in a hundred years, Karen, you and I will be ancient history. And the quilts we have now seem modern and they are totally cool and they're different and they're made with these wonderful tools that nobody had before. And they seem so real to us and so sort of permanent in a way. But but in a hundred years, they will laugh at the rudimentary tools that we had. Oh, they made quilts with these sewing machines. Can you believe it? You know, they had, oh, they had to use scissors. You know, now I just touch a chip in my head and oh, there comes a quilt. So, so we do need to put labels on because it, it's history and it helps people later to put the pieces together and say, okay, I think, we, I think we know what was happening at this time. I think we can understand something about people and understand something about women because we know who made this. And from that label, we can explore her life. Who was Karen Brown? You know, who, what, who was she? What were her family members doing? What was America like? You know, if you, oh my gosh, put, put during, you know, a quilt made uh, in the coronavirus pandemic, you know, and the month that it was, because when people look at the records of how many people died in the particular month that you made that quilt, they'll know something about it, you know? <sighs> It's so, so depressing, but you, you gave me such a great thought about how people are coming to quilt making because of the pandemic and that we are seeing a surge of that. I mean, it's, it's, you know, yeah, but I didn't think about that being a huge engine for a resurgence of it. it's really great insight. And it's just not quilting. I mean, there's crocheters, knitters, but they're just realizing, hey, <laughs> I need something to do <laughs> other than play video games or watch yes. 
complex. There's just a finite amount of time I want to do those things. And of course, yeah. that tactileness, you know, we're not getting the stimulation of conversation or mm -hmm. just the, I call it micro touching, you know, where, where you, you accepted a cup of coffee from somebody else's hand or you shook a hand or things like that. We're not getting any of that. We've got to get it somewhere else. That love of fabric. I mean, you know, when you handle yeah. fabric, it's just amazing. The, the synapses in your head that just start firing away. <laughs> True. And, and yes, there's nothing quite like it. Someone said all people who like to touch fur and fabric, you know, are like, you know, those are my people, right? You just, you just need to touch something. And I think, I think we can all be like that. And cotton fabric people have said, or I don't know where I read it or heard it, but we are, we are born and we are wrapped in cloth and we die and we are wrapped in cloth. I mean, from the cradle to the grave, we are, surrounded by cotton by textiles and it just even now i mean everything talk about micro touch you know there's just fabric on us all the time and around us and it is comforting and it is domestic and it is fe feminine it is female and I, I love that that's awesome you know you know yeah and and my mom used to say when you are raising kids on your own she was a single mom you know three daughters she was like the dishes didn't stay done the homework did not stay done but a quilt block stayed done. So I kept making them. And I think in the pandemic, you know, you can't touch anybody and you can't be with anybody and video games, you know, they're fun, but they don't yield anything. They don't stay done, you know, but a quilt block stays done. What's your favorite quilt? Can you choose your favorite quilt out of all the ones you've looked at? Favorite quilt is, oh, I'm really into art quilts from the 1980s. Just like anything that was like the new, the, the, the wave of people who were like starting to do art quilts like Yvonne Porcella and like Pamela Studstill and like all these like real Nancy Halpern oh my god I used to think that they were not so cool but now they're cool so art quilts from the early 1980s yeah my jam how can people reach you you've you've just started a YouTube channel YouTube channel uh, my blog has been fired up again I mean I have to go slowly I used to blog almost every day but you know it takes time to sort of you know get back into the groove but it is happening um YouTube channel uh on maryfonts.com uh you can sort of hang out with me and all these wonderful people in quilt folk from year to year there's four issues a year we have a giveaway tell yes. us about the giveaway thank you for having me on it's the least i can do for your audience for watching um quilt folk just published our first book it is very big it is a, a coffee table book um 260 pages glossy paper um it's really, it's really, it's really something. It's, you know, photographs from our, from our time Beautiful. on the road for four, four years of Quilt Folk magazine. So um, yeah, let's give one to your, to your audience and uh, I'll sign it. You know, if, if you care about that, I'll sign it. And um, this is, this is like big time and it comes really carefully, you know, packed and everything. So yeah, let's give one away. So Great. go to Mary's channel, subscribe, and just leave a comment in my notes that you've done that. We'll draw from all the people that have. Awesome. That's awesome. Excellent. Yes. Good. Good. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I just love seeing you again. Love seeing you happy. Love seeing you just doing what you should be doing. Thanks. It feels good. It feels, it feels different, but it feels really good. So I hope you enjoyed my interview with Mary Fonz. If you want to enter the contest for your copy of the Quilt Folk book, you need to subscribe to Mary's channel and I'll leave a link to that in the notes below. I'll also leave a link to her website and blog, Paper Girl, and to the Quilt Folk interview with Ken Burns. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Cassia Sinclair, the best-selling author of The Secret Lives of Color and The Golden Thread. And we are talking about color and its impact on history. You don't want to miss it, so be sure to subscribe to my channel. Last week, I uploaded Decluttering Your Sewing Space, part two of my series on organizing your sewing space. If you missed it, I'm going to put a link in the notes below. And check out some of my other interviews on Karen's Quilt Circle as well. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube will notify you when I make new videos. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Just Get It Done Quilts. And of course, my website at JustGetItDoneQuilts.com. So take care, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>